right, welcome back. <clears throat> Hope you guys enjoyed a little bit of a break this weekend. Time off, no homework, no MP, nothing to study for. Hope you guys got outside, away from your screens. Maybe did some things you haven't done for a little while. Um, but we are back and ready to make the best use we can out of the next two weeks, and then we'll have another break. So, so today, our goal is to finish up our primary discussion of recursion as both a concept and a set of programming techniques. So we're gonna do a bunch of problems today. We're gonna look at some problems on trees. We're gonna look at, and then we're gonna generalize this idea of recursion. We'll show how recursion relationships recur uh, when we look at lists and arrays as well. We'll do a little bit of work on lists today, including solving a fairly tricky problem, which is sort of an interview question favorite, actually. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the concept of recursion on arrays, because that's something that we're gonna see again once we talk about sorting in a couple of lectures. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off last time. So last time we got to this problem, which is that we had built up this tree class, we had looked at how to count the number of nodes in the tree. You guys will do a variant of that today on the homework problem. But we, then we got to this question, which is to say, we were looking for the number of nodes in the tree where the value of the right child is greater than or equal to the value of the left child. So as always when we approach these problems, we wanna think about what our recursive algorithm is. There's three parts to the recursive algorithm. The first part is the base case. So what is our base case here computing this on a tree? Remember, we always, you know, recursion is gonna break the problem into pieces that are smaller and smaller and also sort of self-similar, but at some point we actually have to solve the puzzle. At some point we have to solve the problem and begin putting the pieces back together. So what is the smallest subproblem here that I'm going to look at? When should I stop recursion, right? When should I not break the problem down into smaller pieces, that's when I reach a what? It's pretty common for tree-based data structures. Stop when I get where? To a leaf, exactly. Um, so once I've broken the tree down into smaller and smaller pieces and I finally get to a tree with one node, because I've gone all the way down the tree and now I'm at the bottom and I've snapped off a node that's a leaf node, then I'm I should stop. And here I also have a very simple answer because if the node doesn't have a right or left child, then I'm gonna count it as zero. And actually I'm gonna count any node as zero that doesn't have both a right and a left child. I'm only gonna look at cases where I can actually compare the two. How do I make the problem smaller? Again, there's a series of patterns here that we're gonna see on trees. One of the reasons we start with tree recursion is that the problems are very similar to each other in structure. Once we start doing recursion on other data structures, things will get a little bit more interesting. Um, how do I make the problem smaller on a tree? What do I do? Did a weekend off totally deprogram all of you? Forgotten everything you knew? Yeah. Yeah, I look at the left subtree and the right subtree separately. So at any given node, if that node has a right subtree, that subtree is itself a tree, and so I'm gonna restart my recursion on that tree. If it has a left child, that, there's a tree rooted at that node as well, and I'm gonna restart my recursion on both of those trees. So I'm making the problem smaller in each step, because I'm dividing the tree into two pieces, and I've also removed one node, me. So there is, if there's, you know, n nodes in the tree, below me there's n minus one in both of my subtrees because I've removed myself. So if I keep doing this, I can prove that eventually I'm going to get to a leaf node because I'm removing one node from the tree in each step, okay? And then how do, in this case, how do I combine the results together? So I'm essentially going to say, okay, I'm gonna compute the number of nodes where this is the case in my right subtree and then I'm gonna compute the number of nodes where this is the case in my left subtree using recursion, how do I stitch things back together? 
but just look at the sum. So I take the sum from my right subtree, I take the sum from my left subtree, and then I also have to look at myself. So I have to decide if I have a right child and a left child, then I have to do this comparison to see if the right child is greater than or equal to the left child. Questions about this before we go on? This is always critical whenever you're doing these recursive problems, is to set up the problem carefully. It's particularly true once you start writing recursive implementations, because if you don't do this carefully, it's very easy to get extremely unhelpful results when you start running your code. If you don't have a base case, it'll just run forever and then eventually crash, and you're gonna get some cryptic error message that's not gonna be very helpful. So one of the f nice things about showing you how to do recursive implementations, and again, this is true on MP5 as well, is you really do need to start thinking a little bit before you sit down and write code. So I would always encourage you for any recursive problem, that you approach. Make sure that you understand these three steps before you start. Okay, so let's try to do this. Oh, but there was another problem that we had. Sort of where we stopped last time. There's another problem with my tree class. What's wrong with it? I can't actually solve this problem using this tree class. Yeah. Yeah, so if I try to do this with the general Java object, I'm not guaranteed that I can compare two Java objects. I can look for an object in the tree if it's an object, and we'll do that later because every object has equals. But I can't compare two objects. And so before I even start this, I essentially need to go through my starting point, and I'm gonna just rip out every time I see object. I'm gonna replace it with comparable. Later this week, we're gonna look at Java generics, which make this much more fun. But for now, that's what we did, okay. I think we're done. I think I don't, I don't see any more uh, object references. It's possible that I missed one, but let's see if this works. So int, the int primitive type in Java will actually, I don't know if this will work or not. Let's try it. I might need to cast this to an integer. Yeah, oh, I need to return something for my function. Let's do this for now. Ah, right, okay. So int, it turns out, does not actually get properly upcasted to something that's comparable, but my boxing type in Java, which we covered quickly one day, uh, the capital integer works. Okay, so I can now create a tree of capital integers. If I tried to create this tree with something that wasn't comparable, it would fail. But that's correct, because I need this object to be comparable. Okay, great, so now I know that my objects are comparable. So let's go through and do this one together. So as we pointed out last time, a lot of times when I have recursive methods on a tree like this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the recursive method serve as a wrapper to a private method that computes the same result but allows me to start at a particular node. So I can call this recursively. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recur, I'm gonna return call to right greater than left on the root node. Let's just make sure this works. Oh, I need to spell things correctly. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's work through our recursion. Like I said, I really like to start with a base case. So how do I write the base case based on the algorithm we just described? How do I know when to stop? I want that to be my first thing in my recursive algorithm, so I'm sure that I can't miss it. Yeah. If I'm on a leaf, so a leaf is a node that has neither a right child nor a left child. So here I'm gonna return zero. Okay, so I've got my base case in place. Now what's the recursive step? What do I do now? So let's try to, let's try to determine if I'm something that should be counted. So 
I'm going to do, I'm going to say count is equal to zero. And then I'm going to say if I have a left child and a right child, then I need to test myself. So I'm a node that could potentially be included in the count. And we're not going to include any nodes that don't have both a right and a left child. So if I have both, what do I do? Good chance for us to use our handy comparable interface. What do I want to do in here? Yeah, so I want to compare current dot left dot value to current dot right dot value. I'm going to say current dot left dot val dot value dot compare to current dot right dot value. And I get this wrong about half the time. I'm just going to, I'm going to try this in hopes that it's correct. It's possible it's backwards, but the documentation in front of me right now. Okay. Why can I, why do I know I can do this? So I know I have a right node and I know I have a left node. And I would have to look at my constructor to make sure that the constructor isn't putting nodes into the tree that have a null value, but so far that's not happening. So once I know I have a right node and I know I have a left node, I know I can dereference right and left dot value safely, but why can I call compare to? Why am I, why am I given this guarantee? I know that I can use this function. I don't know what kind of object this is. But why am I guaranteed that I can call compare to? Jeremy? Yeah, so my constructor requires an array of comparable objects. And my nodes now store a reference to a comparable object. So this tree is still quite general in the sense that you'll see in a minute, I can load strings into it, I can load, you know, uh, doubles into it, I can load any Java object that implements comparable. But, and so that gives me this guarantee. There's no but, it just works, okay. So in this case, I'm gonna say count is equal to one. So now I've counted myself. Now what do I need to do? I am very close to being done. Yeah, did I, did, is it backwards? Okay, I'll believe that. Better? Greater than or equal to. It's possible, it's possible it's equal. Every time I have to use compared to, I have to look at, I have to squint at the interface very hard. Um, okay, now I'm almost done. What do I want to do now? So I've counted myself. Then what are the subproblems I still need to solve? Yeah. Bingo. I'm going to say return count plus right greater than left on my left subchild plus right greater than left on my right. There's only one small problem with this that I need to fix. Who can see it? I'm really close. I'm almost there. But what can happen here? If I run this, it's possible that I will encounter a null pointer exception. Why? Bingo. Yeah, so I can, so this is, you know, again, usually, it's usually a lot cleaner when you're working on trees to rather than putting this under an if statement. So I could say, if current dot right is not equal to null, count plus equals uh, right greater than left current dot right, if current dot left is not equal to null, count plus equals current dot left, but I'd rather just do it this way. But it, what it means is that I have to make sure that I can handle null cases. So at the top, I'm gonna say now, if current is null, so if I've walked off the end of the tree, return zero, or if I've hit a leaf node, return zero. Okay, let's try this. Oh boy, okay. I still, I do have a no, no pointer exception somewhere. Oh, it's 
sorry. Turn is equal to null or. Okay. Still returning zero. It's possible that that's true. Let's put some more nodes in this tree and see if we can get it to return a non-zero value. Still returning zero. Let me try this. Okay, there we go. Because the order in which I'm adding these nodes to the tree, I think the higher, the smaller nodes are going at the top, right? Questions about this? So again, this is a little bit more complicated than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, Leah. What's that? Question is, do I have to import comparable? Nope. Comparable is provided as a, one of the default imports. Yeah, it's, I can use it without importing. It's a good question. Other questions? Other questions about this? This makes sense to everybody. So these recursion problems we're doing in class, I just want to point out are substantially, I shouldn't say substantially, they're somewhat simpler than the ones that we're gonna ask you guys to do on a PPI. Okay, let's do another recursion problem. We're gonna get more practice with this. So now let's count only leaf notes. So a leaf node is a node that has neither a left nor a right child. So again, let's think through how are we gonna approach this recursively. What's a recursive algorithm? Three parts, what's the base case? When do I stop? Yeah. Yeah, if it's a leaf node, right? Or like I saw before, to make the recursive step a little bit simpler, I can also allow myself to walk off the bottom of the tree. Right, so if I pit it, no, because my recursive step is walked off a subtree that doesn't exist, or if I get to a leaf node, right? Okay. Oh, and I'm supposed to, I'm printing the leaves here. Okay, fine, right? So when I get to a leaf, print the value, I could also sum them. Um, what's my recursive step? Not very different than last time. How do I break the problem into smaller pieces? Yep. Exactly, I tear off the right subtree and the left subtree, and I restart the recursion on each one. And how do I combine the results together? Here I'm printing things to the console, and so there's really nothing to do. I'm just continuing down the tree. If I was counting leaf nodes, I would, you know, count the number of leaf nodes in my right subtree and the number of leaf nodes in my left subtree and combine them together. By construction in that problem, I don't count myself, because if I have a right subtree and a left subtree, then I'm not a leaf node. Right, okay, so let's do this one. So I've gone back to an object-based, oh wait, hold on, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to show you something with this last one that we just did. Okay, so let's put a different type of comparable in here. Let's put one, let's put some strings. And I really have no idea what's gonna happen here. Okay, let's flip this guy around and see if we can get it to. All right, so it depends on how the tree is being constructed. Let's put some more values in here. Yeah, yeah, this tree is being constructed randomly again. So sometimes I'm gonna get one result, sometimes I'm gonna get another. Again, that's what's so cool about interfaces. I can put anything into this that I can compare. And I don't have to compare about I don't have to care about how the comparison is done. Okay, so let's do our print leaves function. Oh, it looks like I forgot an import here. Let me just grab it from the last one. Sorry about that. All right. So again, I'm gonna write a little wrapper function here to actually do the work, starting on the root node. Here I'll say if current is equal to null, then I'm done. Otherwise, if current.left is equal to null and current.right is equal to null, I'm gonna print 
current.value. And then I will simply restart the recursion on my left and my right subtree. Here, print leaves doesn't return a value, and so there's no way to combine them together, so I just do them in, in two separate calls. It's also fine. All right, let's see what happens. Method, oh, method must run, oh, ah, here we go. All right, that seems to work. So in this particular tree, I know that one is, I should never see one printed based on how I'm constructing these trees because it's always at the top. But in this case, what happened is that two was put either as the right or left subchild. Four was clearly added to three. So three is not a leaf node, it has four as a child. Two is a leaf node, it only has one as the parent, no children. If I add more nodes to this, again, the construction is randomized, so I'm gonna see slightly different results every time, but I can still say certain things about what I should never see. I should never see node one, right? Now I will also never see node two or three because I filled that level of the tree. So I have enough nodes that I know that um, both node two and node three at this point should have children. Questions about this? Another example of a slightly different version of a recursive function. But in many ways has the same structure. I have a base case at the top, and I'm gonna stop. I do something in every node, sometimes a little bit of computation, and then, in this case, I don't return anything because I'm just printing things as I go down, but then I restart my computation on both of my subtrees. I can't tell if people are confused or just bored, so I'm just gonna go on. All right, any more questions about tree recursion? Since if not, oh, we have one more problem to do. Good. Okay, so last but not least, and this, is a, this problem is interesting. We're gonna come back to talk about this. Um, but let's search a tree for a particular value. So now I can, again, use a tree that has objects because every object supports equals. That's what I'm gonna use to determine whether or not the tree contains a particular value. But let's write a recursive function that looks in the tree to see if it contains a particular value. This recursive function has a property that the ones that we have written before do not, okay? So, as always, let's identify the three parts of the problem. First one is the base case. So when am I going to stop? This is a little bit different than the ones we've seen before. When should I stop my recursion? When do I not need to continue? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? So in the past, I've stopped at a leaf node, but I, actually sh I can actually do better than this here. Remember, I'm looking for a particular value. As soon as I find that value, I'm gonna return true. So when can I stop? When I find the value, yeah. So this is an interesting example of, you know, the, the recursive functions that we've looked at so far. We've counted the number of nodes in the tree. We've, you guys are summing the number, the values in a tree on today's homework, or we're printing all the nodes, or we're looking for nodes with certain properties. All of those had one thing in common, which is that they visited every node. They had to. To count every node, I have to visit every node. To sum every node, I have to visit every node. To determine where every node has a particular property, I still have to visit every node. This search function does not have to visit every node. As soon as it finds a value that satisfies the condition, in this case, is equal to whatever I'm looking for, it can stop immediately. And so, rather than exploring the entire tree, I can short circuit much more quickly. And this is a property that's gonna come in handy once we start talking about binary search trees, where I start to exploit the structure of the tree to help me actually solve a problem. So up until this point, you know, you might have been wondering, like, what are trees for? I mean, we understand that they store, you know, they, they may represent certain types of hierarchical data, but so far we've been doing these little toy problems that really haven't necessarily utilized the structure of the tree. Remember, whenever we structure data, we're doing so almost always to support some kind of algorithm. And trees are no different, so we will come back to this. But let's talk for now about how to do this on a general binary tree, where there are no rules about the structure. 
I can still, however, stop as soon as I find the value. That's not what this says. Ah, okay. Anyway, ignore my slides. They're clearly wrong. Um, I will fix this after class. So I will stop as soon as I find the value. My recursive step is, again, if, if I'm not equal to the node that we're searching for, I'm gonna look for that node in my right subtree and my left subtree if those exist. And the way I combine results is if I find the node in my right subtree, I return true. If I find the node in my left subtree, I return true. Otherwise, I return false. So if there's no node with that value in the subtree rooted at me, I report that up to my parent. And my parent is combining results from its subtrees and its parent is combining results from its subtrees all the way up. Okay, so let's do this one. In this case, I'm searching for an object, and again, I'm gonna change this to be integers rather than ints so that it doesn't complain. Apologies for not fixing that in the slides before today. So what's my base case? Well, actually, first of all, I still need to use my wrapper function, so I'm gonna return search value root. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna create a private version of this function with a different signature. So it takes an object to look for and a node to start at. Okay. So my base case is either I've walked off the end of the tree or Well, actually, I have to handle these separately, sorry. So if I walked off the end of the tree, what should I return? If I get to a null, like I've walked off the bottom of a, you know, a tree that doesn't have a particular descendant, is the value contained in this tree? No, right? There's no tree here, so I'm gonna return false. So that's one of my base cases. The other one, so now I know that current is not null, so I can say if it equals value, return true. Note that in this case, current may have a right child. It may have a left child. I don't care. I'm done. There is no need to continue the recursion at this point. I have found what I'm looking for. There's, you know, again, this is just, this is not counting the number of nodes that are equal to a particular node, it's just returning true or false. So I can do a variant of sort of the short circuit evaluation we talked about a long time ago when I was evaluating conditional expressions. As soon as I find a value in the tree that's equal to the one I'm looking for, I am finished. I do not need to proceed. Otherwise, I'm gonna return the result of searching for the same value on my left subtree, ordered with the result of searching for the same value in my right subtree. Why am I using or? Because if it's an either the right subtree or the left subtree, or both. There's no guarantee that the elements in this tree are unique. So I might find, both subtrees might find it, right? So if it's in the right subtree, it's in the tree. If it's in the left subtree, it's in the tree. Okay, let's see if this works. Mad at me about something. Oh. Return false, there we go. I had the same problem here that I had before. I apologize for this again. Okay, let's look for something that's not in the tree. Returns false, let's return. Now, let me, and, and let's look at how our search is doing. So let's print off, oh, I have to do this after I know current's not null. Let's print off every node that we visit as we go. So here you can see how many nodes in the tree did I visit? One. Because I found the node right away. I stopped. Did not continue my recursion down the tree. If I'm looking for something that is not in the tree, how many nodes do I have to visit? I have to visit every node. Because I can't be sure that a node's not in the tree until I check every node. Yeah, question. Nope. 
Make sure it's capital. Let's look for another node. So how many nodes am I gonna visit this time? Who can make a guess? So I know because of how I add nodes to the tree that node one is the root. Where is node two gonna be? The first time I add a node, I add it as the root. Then I fill that level. So if the root doesn't have a right child, I add it to the right. If the root doesn't have a left child, I add it to the left. And then I start recursing my add down the tree to fill in other levels, randomly choosing a right or left subtree. So where is two going to be in this tree? One is at level zero, it's the top. Two will be where? Yeah, level one. Two is gonna have one as a parent. It's gonna be one of one's children. One's children will always, because of how I've constructed the tree, be two and three. And so, in this case, I'm gonna look at either two or three nodes. I don't know why it got down to four. Oh, I know what happened. Ah, okay, so this is a good question. Why did this happen? In this case, I visited every node. Why? Yeah. No, you might be right. Yeah, so, so let's look at what's happening on line 56. So what's actually going to happen here is that when I run search at the top, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna check to see if it's null, then it's gonna print the value, it's gonna check its own value to see if it's equal to the one I'm looking for. If it's not, it's going to start a recursion step. But you'll see that that recursion step starts on the left. So in this case, the first place it's gonna look is at node three. Node three is one's left child. So essentially what one is doing is it's saying, I'm gonna look at my left subtree first. And this process continues. So three is now in charge. Three says, okay, I'm gonna look in both my subtrees. I don't have, I don't know whether four is three's right child or left child. Doesn't matter. So three's gonna say, I'm gonna look at all my children. And I didn't find two. And so one now is done with its left subtree. It says, okay, I didn't find a value there, and then it restarts on the right subtree. So this is why I ended up looking at every value. Questions about this? If you didn't understand that, we should pause and... Yeah. So can I. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. So the point is that if I wanted to make this even cleaner, I could do this. Get rid of this spurious return statement here. Now it is a little bit shorter. Right. Questions about this before we go on? Is that a question in the back, question in the balcony? Okay. How else could we make this search more efficient, though? That's a great question. Well, so yeah, so, like I said, up until this point, we really haven't been doing anything with the structure of the tree. The structure of the tree isn't helping us. When we build the tree, you know, we're just putting nodes into it willy-nilly. Say, okay, if you don't have a right subchild, I'll put you there. But we don't have any rules about how we're constructing the tree that would lend it structure that could help us solve certain problems. So let me suggest the following new tree. It's a new tree class. It's a variant of a binary tree that is called a binary search tree. Why is it called a binary search tree? Because it's constructed to make searching efficient. We're gonna come back and talk about this more later, so I'm not sure I'm gonna dwell here
for a while, but I want to show you something about this, which is that here is the add function. Remember before, when I added to my tree, my algorithm was, if I don't have a right or left child, just add the node as whichever slot is available. Otherwise, pick a random subtree and add the node there. To build a binary search tree, I need to have more structure. I have rules now about where nodes go. You'll also notice that I replaced object with comparable here. And the reason is, those rules require that I be able to compare two objects together. So I need a notion of one goes before the other. And so essentially, here's my rule. My rule is pretty simple. When I'm adding a node to the tree, if the node is bigger than the current node, I put it, in this case, I think, based on how comparable works, to the right. So up here, I say if the, if the value is, uh, I think this is actually smaller than or equal to, I should really learn compare to, I'm sorry. So I compare it with the current value. I'm not choosing randomly anymore. If it's smaller than the current value, I go one way. If it's greater than or equal to the current value, I go the other way. And so as I'm building the tree, I now have a principled set of rules that is guiding where a particular node goes. So, and it's possible that uh, the, my recursive, my add is still recursive, right? So I either do one of two things. I either say, okay, if I don't have a right subtree, you're my right child, otherwise I add you to my right subtree. But what this does is it imposes a structure around the tree, and again, we're gonna come back and talk about this problem because this is a really interesting place where we get to do some big O analysis. So I'm not gonna solve this right now, but I want you guys to start thinking about what this starts to look like. And also, how can I make use of this when I search the tree? Again, this is a binary search tree. The search word is there for a reason. Because now, because I have rules about where I put the nodes as I construct the tree, when I add nodes to the tree, I also have rules that I can follow when I search the tree to look for things. Okay, so we will come back and talk about this. I wanna finish up today. So we're basically done talking about trees. You guys are gonna do problems on trees all week for the homework, and we'll have problems on trees for next week's quiz. But one of the things that's so important about recursion and so powerful about it is this is a general purpose technique that we can apply to many different types of data structures. Because many different types of data structures have a recursive property to them. So when we looked at a tree, what we said is that every subtree of a tree is itself a tree. If I tear off the right part of a tree and the left part of a tree, those are both trees. This is also true of a list. So if I take a list and I split it in half, what do I have? Two lists. And if I split those lists into smaller pieces, what do I have? More lists. So every contiguous sublist of a list is itself a list. What's another data structure that I can put up here? Arrays, indeed. So again, if I take an array and I split it into two contiguous pieces, if I divide it in half, what do I have? Two smaller arrays. And if I do that again and again and again, eventually I get down to, in the case of a list, a single item. In the case of an array, a single value. And so I can apply, and we are going to apply, some of the same recursive techniques, particularly on arrays. But we can also apply them to lists. So let me show you a fun list problem. So again, every sublist of a list, you can see my item class is recursively defined. It's defined as a value and then a reference to another item. We pointed this out when we looked at the item class in the first place. So if I take a list, how do I recur on a list? I break it into two problems. Me, my node, and the rest of the list. And I keep doing this. So how do I make the problem smaller? I break it into Two problems, me and the rest of the list. How do I make the problem smaller? I break it into two more problems, me and the rest of the list. And this keeps going until I get to a list with one item. And then I can start to assemble things back together. So in a list, I still need the same things I needed on a tree. I make the problem smaller by breaking the list into the current item and the remainder of the list. 
The smallest subproblem is a list with a single item. That's when I stop. That's my base case. And then I also need a way to combine my results together, just the same as I did with trees. Okay. So this is a fantastic problem. Uh, it's really fun and interesting. It's also, again, a favorite interview question, um, which is, given a linked list, a singly linked list, so I have a list with one pair of links going through it. We talked about those last week. How do I reverse the elements in it? So when I'm done, I want a list that ends at the start and starts at the end, but otherwise preserves the order. So I'm essentially flipping it around. Okay, how do I do that? Well, let's try to think about a recursive algorithm to solve this problem. So, just like with trees, what's my base case? At some point I have to solve the puzzle. Where am I gonna do that? Yeah. A list with a single element. How do I reverse a list with a single element? I don't. It's already, like, it's the same both ways. Right? So once I get down to a list with a single element, I'm done. I could just return it. What's my recursive step? How do I make the problem smaller? So on a list, I essentially say, I'm going to reverse the rest of the list, and then I'll figure out how to combine myself with that. So instead of reversing the entire list, I'm gonna say, now what, I'm just gonna try to reverse all the parts in the list past me. So I'm not gonna, and, and then I'm gonna w figure out how to add myself back into that list. How do I, so let's say that I have a list in front of me and I've reversed the rest of it. How do I combine myself with that list? Where do I go? So I'm going through, there's a list in front of me, I've reversed it, where do I put myself? If I'm starting at the front of the original list and moving to the back, I stick myself at the end. So I'm walking from the front to the back, I reverse the rest of the list, and I know that my new spot is at the end of that list, and so I can put, I can combine the result of reversing the rest of the list with me, okay? So this is a tricky problem to get right. I hope I can do it. Um, let me show you an example of it as a diagram, because I think this will help. So at this point, you can imagine that there's a rest of the list that goes off to the left here that's off the screen. Who cares? I'm looking at a subset. So at this point, what's happened is I've recursed all the way down to item zero, and now I'm starting to combine the results together. So item six said, you know what, I'll just reverse the rest of the list, which has been done. So the remainder of the list, items five, eight, and zero, they started out linked from left to right, and now they're linked from right to left. So the tricky part here is how do I add myself? Now one thing I want to note, you to note, is that I still have a reference to my next item. I haven't changed that yet. And I'm gonna do something really clever. The next item is now the new end of the list. So I know that the new end of the list should have a reference to me. I'm gonna stick myself at the back. That's where I go. So I use my next reference to reach item five, and then I set its next reference to me. <coughs> then I set my next reference to null, because I'm the new end of the list. Right? This is Again, by far the most subtle piece of this. I use my existing next reference to get the new end of the list. I set its next reference to me, that puts me at the back. Then I set my next reference to null. Obviously, I can't do these in the other order, because if I set my next reference to null, I've destroyed the reference I have to the end of the list that I need. So how does this look? Essentially, I've reversed the end of the list. Item six still has this reference left. So I use that. First thing I do is I set item five to have its next reference as me, and then I clear my next reference, because I'm now at the end of the list. All right. You guys want to do this? Kind of fun. 
All right. So here's our linked list class. Okay, and I've got a reverse method waiting for us to finish. Essentially, all I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna reverse the, I'm gonna, again, create a private helper method that I can call. So I can call this on the start of the list. So I'll say if start is not equal to null, reverse the list starting at the start. So what's my base case here? No, I know when to stop. I'm starting from the front every time I'm gonna break off smaller and smaller pieces of the list. When do I, when can I not keep going? Yeah. Right, and how do I know I'm at the end of the list? Right, so if I, if my next pointer is null, then I'm done. This is my base case, I'm at the end. There's one other thing I have to do here. What is it? It's a little tricky. The list class has a reference called start to the start of the list. If my next reference is null, that means what am I? I'm the new start of the list. So I'm gonna do two things here. I'm gonna set myself as the start, and then I'm gonna return. We're, we haven't got there yet. Yeah. Okay, so if I'm at the end, I'm going to, all right? Otherwise, I'm going to call reverse on the rest of the list. So this is my recursive step. I'm essentially saying, you know what? I don't understand how to re reverse the entire list, so I'll just reverse the rest of it. Okay? So this is going to, we hope, have the result of reversing the rest of the list. Now here's where I need to go back to this diagram I just had up. So this is what things look like now. I've reversed the rest of the list. I still have a reference to what was my next item before. I haven't changed that yet. Nobody has changed that. So I'm gonna use that. So I'm going to my previous next item, which is now the end of the list, and I'm sending its next item to me. It's like by far the most kind of mind-bending part of this. And then I set myself, I'm at the new end of the list. God, I hope this works. Let's find out. All right, so we're gonna print the list. So we're gonna call my list at reverse. We'll print it again. Boom. Look at that. What's that? 45 to 47, yes. The, okay, so, if I'm the end of the list, the previous list, I'm the start of the new list, so I modify the start reference on the wrapper class, and I return, I'm done. Otherwise, I reverse the rest of the list. Once the rest of the list has been reversed, my job is to get myself at the end. And so to do that, I take my own next reference, which leads me back to the item that's the new end of the list, and I set its next reference to be me. Then, and this, this is wrong, this should be uh, next.next next equals current, sorry, this is, I will, I will fix that today as well. So this is the first thing I do, so current.next.next .next creates this set of references, so now I'm at the end of the list, and the only thing I have to be careful about is make sure I don't have a cycle. So I'm now the end of the list. It's possible that I am the actual end of the list, but it's also possible that I'm just the end of that part of the list, but whatever. To prepare myself to be the end, I set my next reference to be no. As far as I know, I'm the end of the list. All right, again, this is a challenge problem, but one that will really stretch your understanding of references. Okay. We are out of time. I want to say, you guys can start packing up. We'll finish talking about array recursion on Wednesday. I want to say a couple words about MP5. Okay, so MP5 is out, should be up now. Um, 
This is our first completely new MP this semester. So this is something that we do on a regular basis as part of keeping this class up to date. We have to release new MPs. Technology moves too fast, and the new MPs that are out there get stale, and the answer's all over the internet and stuff like that. So this is something that we do on a regular basis now in this class, okay? Um, a huge shout out to the course developers that led the development of this. They really did 95% of the work on this one. Um, if you have, if you think this MP is fantastic, please, you know, put a shout out to these, um, course developers on the forum. If you think it's terrible, blame me, all right? Um, when we release a new MP, here's what happens. The course assistants have not done this MP. So they are going to struggle a little bit more to help you with it. We are aware of this. The TAs and me and the course developers will all try to provide as much support as possible to help you complete this MP. This is not an easy MP. It's an incredibly good MP. It will introduce you to some new ideas. You guys will have an enormous amount of fun with it. And finally, last and most important thing, this MP is not about chemistry. Please don't complain about that. It's an MP about graph theory applied to chemistry. Have a fantastic time with it. I will see you guys on Wednesday.